Hey folks, here OS Reviews. So a few days ago we did a review on the Samsung Z1, which is actually the first Tizen OS smartphone that we've checked out on this channel. And when we took a look at the phone, I showed you guys a diagram of kind of the Linux Foundation's work and where Tizen came from, including inspiration from Bada OS, from Mego, and that kind of got me thinking, why don't we do a video just showing and revisiting some of the less mainstream Linux-based mobile operating systems that we've seen. Definitely a little sad that after all these years, there's not many of these systems which are still alive. Now, there's Tizen, uh, and there is KaiOS, which is built on Firefox OS, but Firefox OS itself for smartphones is dead. And we also have uh, Selfish OS, which is built very heavily on Mego. But again, these original systems are for the most part dead. Because I was able to stumble upon some older devices, I will be including BlackBerry OS, uh, such as OS X, in addition to Symbian in this video, but these two operating systems technically shouldn't be on this list, I think, because I originally wanted this to be more about non-mainstream operating systems, and I think iOS, Windows Mobile, Windows Phone, you know, Symbian and BlackBerry are pretty mainstream, at least they were popular at, at one point or another. We won't be going super in-depth into all these OSs and devices because we have covered them all in the past, also in throwback reviews, but I guess it's mostly going to be about comparing some of the UI UX differences and how the interfaces uh, differ and are similar to one another. So let's start with the first one over here on the edge. This is running on Ubuntu Mobile, which is, again, another OS that's since been defunct in the past year or so. Um, the sad thing about Ubuntu Mobile is they were never able to pick up specific hardware partners, so if you were interested, you had to port it onto your own device, such as on this Nexus 4 that we have, which is fine for modders and for people who have experience with uh, hacking and rooting their phones, but to the majority of consumers, it's probably a reason why the system was never very successful. But the interface itself is very slick. It gives us different panels to swipe through its gesture base and has this bar on the side for multitasking, very similar to what you see on a actual Ubuntu computer, a desktop, or on Mac OS. And I can drag down the top here to also swipe between different types of notifications and shortcuts. Now one of the selling points of Ubuntu Mobile is just like with Continuum on Windows 10 and with DeX with Samsung Galaxy phones, you can connect it using USB to an HDMI on a monitor and transforming it into kind of a pseudo desktop. Uh, it makes it very powerful for things like productivity and work. And you can also do things like coding, for instance, which makes it actually kind of cool for developers developers and software engineers. So that's Ubuntu Mobile. The next one over here is WebOS. So again, this was the software that was originally designed by Palm before it was acquired by HP, before finally being acquired by LG. So it's been handed off many, many times. And we now see it in some of LG's smart TVs, but it hasn't been released in the form of a smartphone for quite some time. Now, WebOS is very interesting because, again, it's a gesture-based OS that is in many ways ahead of its time because now we have uh, Android Pie Edition, we also have iPhone X, uh, all developing gestures similar to what WebOS had many years ago, including, you know, if I wanted to exit out of an application, I could just flick up and minimize it like that, or I can swipe over to the left or to the right to switch between different apps, kind of like deck of cards. WebOS was also one of the first to introduce these really interesting rounded corners, really just an aesthetic touch, but a lot a lot of the newer Android phones these days also have these rounded corners on the displays, which uh, evokes memories to those who've used a Palm Pre or any WebOS-based phone back in the day. Next, we have access to Asha OS. Asha OS is similar to Android Go Edition, it's similar to KaiOS in the sense that it was never designed for flagships. In fact, it was kind of a rebranded mix between WebOS and Mego, which we saw on the Nokia N9. So we had uh, engineers and teams working on this platform, both from HP's WebOS team in addition to Mego. Essentially, we have a full list of running applications, and on the side, we have what's called a timeline in chronological order that shows up all the apps that we've opened through the phone's history. It's always going to be displayed in this method, and some of them are also widgets, which allow us to see things like images and time and date, as well as notes, as they are being edited in real time. So definitely an interesting uh, UI. We also have a drag down notification shade and in order to exit out of an application we also use gestures so swiping off from the edges to close out of the app which would then show up onto this timeline view. So again a very interesting uh, overall UI that was quite elegant and shared DNA from both of these two smartphone operating systems. 
Migo was another OS that many thought was uh, ahead of its time next to the WebOS platform, a fan favorite of many. And this is a project that was also headed by the Linux Foundation uh, in collaboration with Nokia. Uh, interesting because now today's Tizen is also headed by the Linux Foundation. So it had a backing of more than just one hardware partner, which in this case was Nokia. And on the side here, we have basically cards, which are visualizing all of the open applications in the device's memory. And because there is more RAM than on Asha OS, as feature phones, you're able to multitask more effectively. Kind of similar to WebOS, but as opposed to a left and right kind of sliding way of navigating between open applications, on here it's displayed as a, a flat 2D grid of all the open apps. You can also pinch in to um, maximize and extend the view, or I can also pinch out to make it a little bit smaller. Over on the side here, there's also a third screen that shows off our notifications as well as weather, weather information. So there's three screens that you can cycle between. And let's say I want to exit out of an application, I can swipe up or I can swipe from the left or the right to exit out of that. This one over here is the Omnia HD, which is actually running on Symbian OS. Obviously, it's not something that's designed by Samsung. Symbian was a very popular mobile smartphone OS back in the early 2000s, again, mostly used by Nokia devices, and uh, manufacturers had the freedom of slapping all kinds of launchers on top of it, very similar to what we see with Android today. So this is using Samsung's TouchWiz interface with all these widgets that you can slide through, but if you use a Nokia phone, that would look quite different. They would have a row of different apps displayed as a smaller widget. But uh, just like with Windows Mobile, uh, the early editions of Symbian OS were definitely not as optimized when it came to performance, so a lot, a lot more choppiness when it comes to the scrolling, and it was a more traditional OS compared to the likes of, say, Tizen or Firefox. Now, this also comes across an interesting observation. It seems like Samsung is the manufacturer that has experimented with the most number of mobile operating systems through the years, whether that's for good or for bad. So they've dabbled with Windows Mobile, they've made Windows phones, they've made Symbian phones, you know, they have Bada OS, which is their proprietary OS, they have Android, they also have uh, Tizen. So really, uh, it's more than almost any other manufacturer have uh, ever dabbled in. The next phone in this Samsung trio is Bada. So this is the Linux-based OS that was designed by Samsung entirely so it's entirely in-house, it's completely closed off, and it was meant more for their mid to high-end flagship smartphones released internationally. We never really saw them with uh, contract devices in the United States, but uh, it was a competitor to the likes of uh, Android, except of course had a lot more control by Samsung. Obviously it didn't succeed just because the App Store was very limited in terms of the content, uh, never really caught up because developers were opting for Android or iOS instead. But there was a Samsung App Store on here, you can find versions of apps for Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, and it looks pretty similar to TouchWiz back in the early days of Android. Finally, the latest OS and the one that's still alive that we just checked out very recently is going to be Tizen. So Tizen, again, is really a branch off of both Bada and Migo. So we see inspiration in terms of how some of the icons look, as we discussed in a video review of the Z1. But uh, overall, it's a very elegant UI that uh, keeps up surprisingly well despite the low-end hardware, since, as aforementioned, there's a lot of web apps which don't take up as much space to install on the phone and keeps things relatively light. But it also includes some regular C++ and C apps on here which are physically downloaded onto the device's memory, including some of the games, such as Asphalt, for instance. So this is the, what the interface looks like. We have a drag up screen for additional apps. So next up, we have Firefox OS, which just like Ubuntu Mobile was discontinued in the past year and a half. And it's a little bit unfortunate, but we do see the kind of code as well as the idea of Firefox still living on in Kai OS, which has recently received a bit of investment from Google, about $30 million to develop Google apps for the platform. And again, it's meant for emerging markets and feature phones. But uh, Firefox OS was designed for full-fledged smartphones like this one over here. The interface is very simple, especially on this version 2.0. It's basically a vertically scrolling list of all your apps, and that's it. There's a drag down notification shade for accessing notifications and for uh, com communications, and there's also a universal search that can allow us to search up both the internet as well as apps which we have on the phone. Uh, but as a whole, slight quirks with Firefox OS would be the fact that I don't find it to be the most responsive out of this 
list. In fact, I think Migo, in addition to Tizen and Ubuntu Mobile, are more responsive. I'm not sure if that's down to optimization, but you can tell how with the drag down notification shade, it just seems a little bit more jumpy, not quite as smooth uh, in terms of performance. Web browsing was another highlight, just because it was very powerful and allowed you to visit you know, any desktop class site that loaded up and optimized pages quite well compared to Android. Of course, the marketplace was still quite restricted and limited when it comes to uh, availability of apps and titles compared to iOS and Android, and that's one of the reasons, again, why it didn't fare so well. You can long hold on the home key on Firefox OS phones to open up multitasking, where you're able to kind of flip them to close them up, very similar to WebOS, very similar to uh, kind of Mego. So all of these gestures are again borrowed. The last one we're just going to take a look at is, I guess, BlackBerry OS. And you're able to also use gestures for navigating around, especially on some of their full touchscreen phones like the BlackBerry Q10, for instance. You have access to the store, which you can swipe left to right to have access to all your applications. And because BlackBerry at one point did very well, almost dominating the smartphone market, especially for business professionals, you will find more app content in their store in comparison to these other platforms, especially Firefox OS and you know, the likes of Sailfish or Tizen, which are much more bare bones at this point. So you can still find titles like WeChat, WhatsApp, and many of the other product productivity tools inside. Uh, otherwise, the navigation still feels quite smooth and responsive. Uh, apps are also displayed as cards, very similar to WebOS, so you're able to kind of uh, close them up by shrinking down these screens and then flicking them up. To with that being said, BlackBerry OS is also more optimized for keyboard devices because of BlackBerry's legacy as a manufacturer of business-oriented phones with uh, QWERTY boards. And as such, you'll find more things like Universal Search, which you can just start typing along to bring up results from Bing, as well as all your apps. So Universal Search and some more security features compared to WebOS for things like uh, encrypting your data, BlackBerry Messenger, BlackBerry Hub, things like that, that uh, made navigation using a keyboard slightly more effective and as such, the gestures weren't quite as polished, in my opinion, as on WebOS. So that's more or less been our video, going through kind of the UI and design differences between all of these interesting mobile operating systems, which are based on Linux, and we've seen through the years. It also goes to show how competitive and difficult it is to survive in a very crowded mobile landscape with manufacturers opting to go in very different directions and uh, in the end uh, not many of these platforms have the room to truly succeed and that's what we're seeing now where all of a sudden we seem to only have Android and iOS. Although Tizen OS remains one of the last few alive OS's that are competing in terms of market share with Android and iOS, it's kind of been a downhill fight because although we see Tizen OS on many smart TVs and wearables from Samsung, we haven't really seen it too much from their smartphones. In fact, there's only five smartphones that they've ever released and none of them happen to be here in the United States. They're all budget-oriented devices. And historically, Samsung has released one new Tizen smartphone a year, but they've missed their 2018 deadline. So who knows if Tizen really has a future or not, whether it's gonna be faded out. But anyways, which one of these smartphone mobile OSs are your personal favorites? Let us know in the comments down below and whether you guys think that any of these were underrated or have the promise to make a resurgence or a revival in the future. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That was a closer look, a revisited look at some of these non-mainstream slash interesting Linux mobile OSs in history.